Yeah, we go. All right. I'd like to welcome everyone to our first um, lecture in this year's uh, chemistry, uh, Dwayne L. Ford Chemistry and Biochemistry uh, Seminar Series. Um, so Dr. Murray has a, um, set up, I think, a really great uh, list of uh, presenters this uh, year. So we're looking at uh, what we've got, I think, five external speakers uh, this fall semester and about 14 coming uh, planned in uh, for spring. All of our presentations this year will be uh, by Zoom. Um, it's uh, what makes sense in a, an age of COVID. Uh, we look forward to someday when we can go back to live lectures again. Um, and you know, something that's always cool about our chemistry seminar series, and I appreciate Dr. Murray's work on this in the past, and uh, he's done this again and uh, for this planning year. So there's basically a bunch of different topics that are uh, touching on uh, things that we care about here. Um, and so I think we've seen what the series of topics is, but you know, we're uh, some of the topics are plant-based drug discovery. Uh, we'll hear more about that today. Uh, vaccine development, I, uh, tools to identify fake, fake news, fake science, um, government's role in science. We're hearing about um, chemistry of blood cells, relationships between science and theology, carbon cycle, some molecular basis of bipolar disorder, uh, chemistry at the bottom of the sea. So there's a lot of interesting topics that are, um, you know, some very uh, traditional kind of chemistry topics, but we know that chemistry touches on a bunch of different areas. And so we'll hear about uh, some of those other areas. Um, and so in addition to an, a wide variety of topics, we have presenters coming from a lot of different places as well. We have uh, some leading uh, organic chemists, synthetic organic chemists, uh, some carbohydrate chemical biologists, a NASA scientist, a uh, theologian, uh, maybe the uh, chem the science and theology. And we have actually the chair of the uh, Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Uh, this is actually a, a chairship that's uh, for the U.S. House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is an African-American lady, and she's going to be giving our last uh, presentation of the fall uh, here in, in October. Um, people are coming from all over the uh, country, and I see a Canada on here as well. Uh, so we're grateful for the participation of all of our speakers and for all of the uh, audience members who are uh, starting their journey for this class uh, or for this seminar series. Um, so, I guess without further ado, I'd like to uh, do my second job of uh, introducing a uh, uh, speaker. So this is uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Cox, and he has really a very illustrious uh, academic or trajectory that he is joining us from. So we're really honored to uh, have him join us uh, here at Andrews University uh, today. So. He uh, um, graduated from Brigham Young University uh, in Salt Lake City, I assume. I, no, it's in Provo, yes? Okay, uh, sorry about that, uh, in Utah. And so then he uh, went as a Fulbright uh, scholar, he went on and studied at the University of Wales uh, in uh, the United Kingdom there on the Western side. Then he came back and uh, received uh, further graduate degrees, including a PhD uh, in uh, biology from Harvard. And he was a recipient of a, a National Science Foundation fellowship there. And interestingly, uh, what I discovered is, uh, you know, sometimes science people, they are very focused on science. Sometimes they have broader interests. He actually was awarded a, a prize in literature twice during his time at Harvard. So that's really cool. So very good. So after finishing, he continued on doing amazing things. He was at University of California, Berkeley for a while. This is maybe the top University of California school. Um, and uh, then he uh, went on and uh, was a research uh, fellow at Melbourne uh, University in Australia. And then he was also a uh, professor of environmental biology at the University of Uppsala in uh, Sweden. So he's published a total of 200 uh, scientific papers, maybe more by now, uh, as well as four books. 
And so he's going to talk to us about uh, today, I think, about the area of um, uh, basically uh, finding medicines from plants, uh, what's called ethnobiology. Uh, and so, and so it's actually an interesting topic, a very interesting topic, and I think there's uh, some a lot of promise in it. One of the things that's actually very interesting that I, I found out somewhere, I will stop very soon, um, is that you know, there's been a lot of interest in the national parks uh, recently. And so one of the most hardest to get to national parks in the country is, is the National Park of American Samoa, right? Mm -hmm. You can an airplane ticket and you can go up to the gates of the Arctic. It'll cost you a pretty penny, but it's doable. And there's about, you know, 10 or 15 more in Alaska. So anyways, the one that's, the, in my opinion, the hardest one to go to is the, is the National Park of America in Samoa. And I think that uh, Dr. Cox was actually instrumental in convincing people to set aside that land uh, for the National uh, Park there. So if you guys, if you ever get to the National Park of American Samoa, I need a selfie in front of that National Park sign. That's the best one ever. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, I will uh, turn the rest of the time over to uh, uh, Dr. Cox. To well, thanks so much, Professor Randall and uh, Professor Morris. And uh, it's great to be with you today. I decided to broadcast, instead of from Jackson Hole, from a tropical greenhouse. So this is Cactus and Tropicals here. We drove to in Salt Lake City, Utah. Many thanks to them for uh, uh, allowing us to be here because the major point I want to make is that where other people see a forest, I see a pharmacy. Hmm. And that there's a lot of things, a lot of new medicines remaining to be discovered from studying tropical plants. So I just want to make sure that you can hear me. Is that okay, Professor Randall? And Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Desmond. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna try to do now is to share my screen with you. There we go. So I wanna talk about the future of plant-based drug discovery. Uh, and I illustrate this with a peacocky, Jasmine and Stanback on the left and uh, Sinja Brazera, but on the left, I was spent Labor Day weekend in Maui hunting these uh, really somewhat rare plants and uh, there's time we can talk about them. So uh, um, Earth <coughs> biodiversity is pretty staggering uh, and that maps onto chemical diversity. But it turns out of, of 11,500 different structural chemical families, only 60% uh, have ever been synthesized. So nature is producing some stuff that is uh, totally beyond our ability as chemists to synthesize. Let's see here. However, about 50% of all of our pharmaceutical compounds are derived directly from biodiversity. I'm going to talk about plants today, but remember that bacteria and fungi also produce some important uh, plant compounds and plant drugs. Uh, and then something I want to come back to on the end is that 85% of the world's population depends directly on plants uh, for medicine. And I want to look back to that. So let me sort of show you how chemistry and plants can together provide new medicines. First of all, not all life forms produce useful bioactive molecules. Turns out there's very few drugs derived from mobile animals. Here's a little bird called Pitahui dichroas in, in uh, uh, New Guinea. And its feathers are toxic. They discovered this because some of the first people who collected it got intoxicated. Uh, and then you've all heard of the poison arrow frogs. And these are actually being used now to produce some really interesting compounds that are used for pain relief. So there are a few, but these are the exceptions. Both scientists and indigenous people usually derive new drugs from molecules uh, from sessile organisms, principally marine invertebrates and plants. Question is, why is it the immobile things that have the interesting chemistry? And the answer is that they can't run away. So, uh, um, 
here we have a, a, a really interesting plant in Kauai, uh, where I spent six or seven years at the National Tropical Botanical Gardens called Brigamia. It's a beautiful plant. You can only find it on cliffs. And our botanists at the garden had to repel down the cliffs to hand pollinate these plants. Hmm. But it used to be more widespread. That is until the Polynesians introduced pigs. And these plants had no evolved defense, thorns or thistles or chemistry against pigs. So they're only where the pigs can't go now, which is in uh, 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 these cliffs. Um, let me show you a cactus from uh, down in Chile. How do plants communicate to potential herbivores their defensive status? Well, here's a sheep. Um, do they vocalize? The sheep goes bah, uh, <laughs> met with, uh, you know, tremendous silence from the cactus. Because imagine, I don't know if you've ever had that nightmare of where you're stuck in quicksand and can't get away from a monster. This is what plants deal with all the time. Hmm. Plants don't vocalize. We hear that mathematics is the language of science. Well, maybe it's the language of scientists, <clears throat> uh, but here's a counting sheep. And uh, yes, plants are very good mathematicians. They, on this cactus, put their uh, leaves and spines in a Fibonacci series, which you might realize, but there's no communication here. Mm -hmm. Turns out the real language of plants and animals and the way they communicate. And one of the reasons I'm so grateful to receive this uh, invitation from uh, Andrews to speak today was that the, 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 the communication medium is chemistry. So of course the sheep says, well, here's some nice fertilizer here and communicates with a little bit of organic things. And sure enough, the cactus, Trichoceras pachinoi, communicates back with mescaline. And what this really means is don't ever come back here again. I mean, any <laughs> plant that's gonna eat, any sheep that eats that is gonna have a very bad night and a lot of nightmares. Don't ever come back here again. So. Uh, plants through evolutionary time have evolved these chemical defenses against insects, mammalian herbivores, and some of these are very useful to us as people as medicines. Now, there's different ways to screen plants to try to see this biodiversity. One that was adopted by the National Cancer Institute is a random screen, um, and this turned up Taxol which was derived from the Pacific yew tree, Taxus brevifolia. And this is probably the most important uh, anti-cancer compound discovered in the late 20th century. It's produced by Bristol-Myers Squibb, and it's approved by the FDA for treatment of both ovarian cancer and uh, breast cancer. I played a very small role in the development of Taxol. I worked with the National Cancer Institute and I worked with one of their contractors to try to get this into cell culture. And originally it was taken from the bark of the tree. National Cancer Institute called me up, Dr. Gordon Craig, and said, hey, they're gonna log the forest where we got Taxol. I said, well, don't they understand it has this chemistry compound? They said, well, yeah, but they don't understand this. Can you please try to help them? Um, Later, I played a very small role again, a very small role in helping to get this into cell culture so it doesn't need to be harvested from the trees. Uh, in the meantime, there's been a complete synthesis done, but I think most of the uh, medicinal compound uh, is now derived from cell culture. Um, very interesting compound. I was I actually had... Uh, CBS Evening News, John Roberts, come interview me in Kauai. I was talking about it from one of our greenhouses like this. There were some tourists that had gathered to hear the lecture. They wanted to chase me. I said, no, let me just ask them to be quiet. Second, I started talking about Taxol. Tears started coming down this woman's face. She jumped over the uh, TV camera, almost knocked the cameraman over, and hugged me. She said, that saved my life. I was terminal ovarian cancer. 
and tax all saved my life. And I didn't know that it came from a plant. Hmm. Let me show you a few things other people may not know came from plants. Uh, an ecological screen is used to look at the ecology of the plant. Of course, snails and other mollusks are real parasites on plants. So sure enough, some plants have developed some very interesting chemistry. And a team uh, led by Kurt Hotstetman in the medicinal chemistry department at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland has discovered these anti-molluscicidal compounds from acacia species in Africa. And the reason that these are so important is that schistosomiasis takes out millions of people in Central Africa. And one of the vectors of the parasite are these snails. So you can go and you can dose the whole school with children to get rid of their infection. But as soon as you leave, they go back and bathe in the river or swim in the stream and they pick up the infection. So I think the genius of the Swiss scientists, and again, uh, my hat's off to uh, Kurt Hochstetmann um, and Hamburger, um, they took this natural product and they put it into laundry soap and shower soap that's distributed to the people in Africa. So when they go in there to bathe in the stream, they dose and get rid of all the snails, thereby stopping this terrible cycle of schistosomiasis. Another type of screen is phylogenetic, where we look at the evolutionary tree, the family tree of the plants. Samantha Gerlach uh, at Tulane, and now the visitor in our laboratory, she teaches at Dillard University in New Orleans. Together with her, we've been discovering these amazing cyclotides. These are circular proteins. They have these three, three disulfide bonds. And we found that they're very active against glioblastoma to the point that we can reduce by about eightfold the uh, drug dose required of TMZ, the uh, chemotherapeutic agent used for glioblastoma. And we're really interested in this, particularly for children. Glioblastoma is a real killer. So we're pushing hard to try to see if we can um, get the animal studies done and then go into clinical trials on some of these cyclotides. And my former colleagues at the University of Uppsala in Sweden were real pioneers in this study. And these plants that have cyclotides are like the violets, Rubiaceae, which is the coffee family, the Apocynaceae, the dogbane family. There's also genetic uh, um, screens. Uh, one of my heroes is Kurt Venter. He's one of these guys like Eli, you know, Elon Musk that sort of just doesn't go with the flow. He uh, had his own sailboat here, went out in the Atlantic and uh, started doing these shotgun DNA screenings where he found all sorts of new studies, uh, new types of rhodopsin molecules. And really the uh, techniques developed by Craig Venter are now being used to look at microbial diversity for a variety of drugs. But what I want to spend my time here on talking about is ethnobotany. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but every scientist that talks about their own discipline typically has a little diagram where their discipline is in the center of all science and all arrows <laughs> point in. I won't do that. Sometimes I'm introduced as one of the world's top 50 ethnobotanists because there's probably only 25 of us in practice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, here's sort of where my work is. What's ethnobotany? It's the study of how indigenous people use plants. And I want to lead to a story about how we discovered a new anti-HIV AIDS candidate by studies of native healers in Samoa. So this is not a new idea. This is actually a very old idea. William Withering in 17... 74 published his analysis of the foxglove digitalis purpurea from which was derived this compound digitalis this compound is still remains today the treatment of choice for rapid atrial fibrillation as you can see it's a cardiac glycoside when taken into the body it breaks off this glycone and is really 
very potent at treating rapid atrial fibrillation by increasing the pumping action of the heart. Now, Withering did not come up with this on his own, and he's very candid about this. He learned it from what he called an old woman, which is how healers have typically been denigrated. All over the world I go, they're called witch doctors or old women or folk healers, but she had this, she was using the leaves of this to treat people with dropsy. We don't see dropsy anymore. It's caused by inadequate pumping action of the heart. People swell up, they retain fluid, so their arms are, 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 are thick, their legs are thick. They start getting edema, accumulation of water in their lungs. He took careful notes. So he was really one of the early ethnobotanists discovering drugs, then prepared the sample the same way she did. He got the leaves. And there's a really key step here to what we call bioassay guided fractionation. So you wanna get the, the crude extract from the plant you keep going back to the bioassay and keep fractionating it, typically with different polarities of solvent till you get a pure and pure compound. All Withering had for his assay at that point were his own patients. Mm. Um, and then you identify a structure. This is typically done the way they teach you in the chemistry department uh, using nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, NMR, ideally x-ray crystallography. Uh, to save time, we <laughs> use a lot of tandem mass spectrometry in my lab. And boom, if all these pieces, the pipeline are together, you get digitalis. So here's this folk knowledge in England uh, that has now led to the major treatment in emergency rooms all over the world for treatment of rapid atrial fibrillation. And a lot of people with congestive heart uh, failure are also put on this drug. Let me show you another one that's sort of cool. This is Ralvolfia serpentina. This car is in Bihar province of India. There, uh, if your child is unpleasant or causing trouble, instead of threatening them or saying, I'm gonna count to three, say, hey, chew on this root here. <laughs> the kid chews on the root, immediately mellows out, puts them to sleep, <laughs> and this plant is called Ralvolfia <laughs> serpentina. It was originally reported from folk medicine in India, Ayurvedic medicine, by some Indian chemists. This guy at, uh, called Dr. Emil Schlittler at uh, uh, Sibagaygi in, in Switzerland picked up on this. And we had reserpine, which is the very first drug ever issued for treatment of high blood pressure that did not involve vasodilation, just increasing the diameter of the blood vessels. And again, we see the same sort of plant medicinal pipeline where there's an ethnobotanical study of folk medicine, samples prepared, here's the root, bioassay guided fractionation done very carefully on mice to show that it actually lowers blood pressure by speaking to the hypothalamus. Hmm. Structural identification, in this case, NMR and X-ray crystallography, and boom, we have this drug. Now, Resoprene isn't uh, prescribed a lot anymore, but it opened up a whole new vista. That yes, we can treat blood pressure without doing vasodilation or giving people diuretics. Let me give you another example, Vincristine. Mm -hmm. You have a child that has leukemia, they're gonna put them on vincristine or vinblastine, uh, a parent alkaloid, which comes from the Madagascar periwinkle, Catharanthus roseus. This was being used in Jamaica of all places mm. by healers. A team at the National Cancer Institute studied this, did exactly the pipeline I showed you. In the 1960s, this came out again, an extraordinary important medicine that saved the lives of tens of thousands of children. So let me go into my own work here in Samoa. These are islands in the South Pacific. I had the wonderful opportunity as a 19 year old to serve as a missionary for my church. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. And when you're raised this way, you save your money up and you don't know where they're gonna send you. You wait for this big envelope that comes from headquarters <laughs> and you open it up and your family's around and it says, you're going to spend the next two years in Samoa. 
Uh -oh. I correctly figured out that's where they hide missionaries that they don't want to embarrass in the church elsewhere. <laughs> and uh, as soon as I got down there, they took one look at me. How do we not embarrass this kid in Samoa? So they sent me off to this outer island. Uh, I had a companion who was learning how to speak English by reading the Old Testament. I do not recommend this <laughs> as a procedure. <laughs> but the people were so kind to me. They taught me their language. They taught me a lot. So I went back with my wife, Barbara, who's here with me today, and we found that healer Mariana Lilo was using this, this tree, Homolanthus newtons, to treat hepatitis, hepatitis C. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it was about that time I got a letter from the National Cancer Institute saying, Paul, do you have any ideas for antiviral medications that could treat HIV? So I thought about this. Let me show you how it works. Here's Mariana Lilo. She gets the bark of that tree, Homolanthus newtons. She scrapes it into a clean cloth and makes a tea. Now it turns out that the compound she's extracting here is a, is a four ball ester, but she's re extracting only the polar version of it. She throws away the contents of that tea bag and that's really good because four ball esters are really uh, uh they, they cause intense dermatitis but not the polar one which is called prostratin doesn't cause any problem at all she uses it to treat uh um hepatitis c with the permission of the healers and the village chiefs and the prime minister of samoa i was able to take back samples of the healer portion and plant the National Cancer Institute, and they're a wonderful team of chemists uh, led by uh, Dr. Gordon Craig, uh, Michael Boyd, John Cartolina II did some beautiful NMR work. We discovered 12,3-deoxy-4-ball or prostratin, which is really uh, still under development as an anti-HIV AIDS drug because it uses a completely different mechanism of action and very exciting. Now, I thought that it was really important that the uh, healers and the villagers and the country participate in any commercialization. So together with the uh, HIV, excuse me, the AIDS Research Alliance in West Hollywood uh, and the National Cancer Institute, of any commercialization of this compound, 12.5% will re be returned to the Samoan government, 6.7% of the village that allowed me to do this work. 0.4% to each of the two healer families for a total of 20%. This was before the Convention on Biodiversity, the Rio treaties. And uh, I, I was quite proud. My dad really wondered why I want to be a botanist. And here I made the business section of the Financial Times. You know? <laughs> Samoa to get percentage of AIDS drugs profits. So he says, well, You've made good, my son. So, <laughs> so there we go. But this same ancient procedure developed a couple hundred years ago by William Withering promises to continue, continue to discover new drugs. After we got this uh, HIV AIDS drug moving through the pharmaceutical pipeline, I got so emotionally involved with the uh, AIDS community. And I have to say that Something that, Desmond, I don't think your students understand is that in the 80s, it was a very different, very yeah. different sort of disease. Mm -hmm. And um, I got so emotionally attached to these people, and it was just wiping them out. I mean, it was just, God, it was awful. And unfortunately, the country was slow. I think slow to get moving on AIDS drugs. And these people were calling me up saying, we're praying for you, keep going. I was just a, so I wanted to find something else where it been an old sort of, problem that it didn't there were no good drugs out as wiping out whole families so i chose als lou gehrig's disease which is a paralytic illness i assembled a team we started looking again in the pacific the island of guam at the chamorro people this is our uh, chemist dr susan merch on the left she got her phd at the university of guelph uh interesting enough she uh got her undergraduate degree in chemistry as an adult which I always find charming when people a little bit later in life say, hey, you know, I want to go back and do chemistry. Well, my hat's off to him. <laughs> Dr. Sandra Bannock uh, from the University of California, Fullerton, myself, we had some neurologists, 
and physicians. And we went to these two villages where 25% of the people are dying from this weird periodic disease. We followed up on a tip from Marjorie Whiting at the University of Hawaii that there might be a link to this weird sort of dinosaur type plants called cycads. What we added to the pile of information was our knowledge that cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria, grow in these little specialized roots that are burst through the soils so that can be in the sun. Uh, so when the people there take the kernel or gametophyte of these seeds, they make tortillas that they can eat, um, they get a pretty big dose. We also found these really cool bats called flying foxes eat the cycad seeds. And then the animals eat these seeds and they get a big dose of the toxin. And when the people cook these flying foxes, they eat them all, uh, you know, fur, head, they cook them in coconut cream. And what's interesting, there have been other NIH people interviewing, but none of the locals told them about this because they're embarrassed. They know that the foreigners aren't into this, but we're ethnobotanists, we learn their language, we hang out in the village. And it turns out this is their most desired food item. Mm. So they're getting a, a real dose of a weird neurotoxin called BMA. So the hypothesis we published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences was that this bacteria, that the cyanobacteria produce this unusual amino acid called beta N methylamino L alanine or BMAA. Uh, then that accumulates in the tree through various roots, people making tortillas or dumplings out of the seed flour or eating bats or deer, even pigs have eaten the seeds. They get this dose and it kills them. Well, how do you go about demonstrating something like this? Um, I talked to Oliver Sacks in New York City. He was a really famous neurologist. He was a really great guy, he taught me remedial neurology. When I told him what we'd found, he called in Kate Edgar, his assistant, and said, hey, this guy here has figured out the Guam problem. I said, well, if you really believe that, will you publish with me? So my first paper in neurology, again, I'm a botanist, think of that. This is way <laughs> out of my field here, was with Oliver Sacks. We called it our batty hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> but what we found is this, that that compound BMA is a non-protein amino acid that gets confused by our uh, DNA, by our cellular mechanisms. So as our proteins are being found, it can mischarge tRNA for serine. It, it substitutes for the normal amino acid serine. Now, as you all know, there's 20 different amino acids that make up our proteins. BMA isn't one of them. <clears throat> But when they eat these tortillas or bats, it misfolds their proteins. Mm. ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, half a dozen other diseases are characterized by misfolded proteins. So then I started thinking, well, cyanobacteria typically grow in water, but about 10 years after Operation Desert Storm, when uh, UN forces led by the United States kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. A bunch of the soldiers, 10 years after deployment, started coming down with ALS. Hmm. They had three times the rate of ALS as soldiers that had the same training but were not deployed to the Gulf. So I thought, well, this disproves my hypothesis. I grabbed Dr. Walter Bradley in the University of Miami, the world's ALS expert. We flew down the Gulf and started freewheeling around there. And as a scientist, you're trained to always try to disprove your own hypothesis. Well, it was very hot, <clears throat> and I decided I'd pour some water on the desert, and all of a sudden, it started greening up. It turned out, at least in these vast areas of Iraq, Kuwait, and Qatar, where I was working in Qatar, it only takes about five minutes, and boom, these are dried cyanobacteria. The whole place is one cyanobacterial mat, and they just sit there desiccated all year. They're just waiting for this week or two of rain in January or February when they run their life cycle. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that as our soldiers were walking behind the trucks and the tanks, 
they're breathing in all this dust and they're getting this toxin that the Chamorro people in the village are getting. And it also turned out, as we looked at the military specialties, <clears throat> that it was the ground troops who were getting ALS, getting sick. It was also the helicopter pilots. And the, it was so dusty, the helicopters, they have to have their engines rebuilt after 24 hours of flying time. And the guys ripping out the engines hmm. were getting covered with dust. So this sort of added to it. Well, then I thought, well, you know, here we're going to like a place that has the <coughs> highest rate of Alzheimer's ALS in the world. In Guam, here's Umatic Village. Let's go to a place that has no record of all. So that took me up to Ogimi Village in Okinawa, known as Longevity Village, because these ladies live to be over 100 years old. This typical lunch they gave me. Notice they're not eating rice. They're getting most of their calories out of tofu up there in the upper right-hand corner. And they're eating a whole bunch of different seaweeds, a little bit of pork. Even this weird citrus they have there has L-serine. So they're getting about five times the amount of L-serine. We found in our cellular studies, when we added serine to the human neuronal cell cultures, we could stop the protein misfolding. Hmm. Let me show you this lay, if I can get find my cursor here. Okay, maybe, shoot, I had a little film there. I, trying to sh I can't see my cursor here. Well, shucks, this is a lady who actually looks like a ballerina, even though she's 98 years old, <laughs> eating all these seared seaweeds. So the question is, could serine, which looks like this weird neurotoxin we discovered was, you know, getting produced by cyanobacteria in Guam, could that actually produce this disease? Um, it's common in soybeans, common in seaweeds. Could it block this misincorporation of BMA? So we went down to uh, St. Kitts in the Caribbean. And Desmond, this is something I think is going to thrill your heart with gladness because okay. it was a cold November in Wyoming in Jackson Hole. I mean, even the antelope are getting out of there because it's so cold. <laughs> I went into the lab. I asked all my uh, team, I said, would any of you be willing to go down to St. Kitts? And, and, you know, not too far from Jamaica mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and spend the winter looking after these monkeys. And every one of my scientists volunteered, <laughs> volunteered. David, I see you smiling. Doesn't that fill your heart? The nobility of science, right? Yeah. So, so, so we all took turns going down there. The reason I chose St. Kitts was that a couple of centuries ago, some weird sailor threw off two African green monkeys called burbots. And they just so happened, Adam and Eve monkey, to be have a mutation for APOE4, which is the gene that in human beings gives you an increased likelihood of Alzheimer's disease. Hmm. There's no natural predators. There's 40,000 of them down there. So there's a nice facility. They're all housed together. Such a nice place. The wild monkeys are trying to break in, get in our facility. So we have this great team. And we would feed the animals their regular meal the end of the meal, we give them a piece of fruit. Here, a banana. We put in a test substance. We never forced any animal to take its dose. They now know me in St. Kitts as the vervet whisperer because I'd sort of coach them and explain my research to them. <laughs> what we found is we we're able to produce a dense tauopathy. This is what you see in an Alzheimer's patient: dense tangles, neurofibrillary tangles of misfolded hyperphosphorylated tau protein as well as amyloid pack, plaques, which were a little sparse. But the animals, none of the control animals that had rice flour in their bananas got this. Mm -hmm. But the ones we added serine to their diet had about 85% less of this. Wow. So we went to the, uh, published a little paper here in the Royal Society in London, and we went to the FDA. And we said, hey, we'd like to start clinical trials for human beings. You always hear how the FDA is really slow. Well, they approved this trial four days after receipt. Wow. So we had molecular data, we had monkey data, we had the ethnobotanical data, and we published this trial, boom, for 20 ALS patients. Let me show you what we found at our highest dose, which is 15 grams a day, twice a day. We slowed ALS by 85%. Wow. So we went right back to 
uh, the FDA, they approved a phase two trial for 50 ALS patients up at Dartmouth Medical School. And we're gonna get a little peek at the data now for that, that's pretty exciting. They also approved a trial for Alzheimer's disease, 40 early stage Alzheimer's patients. We're gonna see that data very soon. So we're pretty excited. Um, the Alzheimer's trial, we made these gummies. Uh, it turns out people don't like it when you hand them a banana with something shoved in there. So <laughs> we made these gummies. So the trial's randomized, double-blinded, with placebo controlled. And I'm really excited to announce, and I think this might be the first public announcement, hmm. we're beginning this fall, a phase two trial for mild cognitive impairment. This is sort of the precursor to Alzheimer's. People can still hold a job, read a map, but they're, you know, these things aren't quite clicking. We're in treating 100 patients at Houston Methodist Medical Center. They'll be randomized, receive l serine placebo. And we're gonna give them before and after I have MRI, PET, FDG scans. So we can see how they're burning glucose in their brains and then cognitive testing. So there's no, no drug approved by the FDA for mild cognitive impairment. Plus if this trial works, it's in a way showing that we can help prevent Alzheimer's disease. So hmm. it's gonna be a fun trial. We're pretty excited about this. Wow. So let me just conclude on a couple of things. I think I've, we've gone about, we're, we're almost over time, Desmond, is that right? So let me just wrap oh, up. We, we are doing okay, we are doing okay. It's 5.11. Yeah, okay. Uh, about um, nine minutes until the official end. Okay. okay, okay. Who reaps the benefits of biodiversity? I'll just do this quickly. Well, in the West, you know, I mean, honestly, I had three pharmaceutical firms meet with me at a pharmaceutical meeting. And I said, okay, what do you can? I said, well, we're really into appetite suppression. I said, you know, indigenous people are out there trying to find enough to eat. They're not really into appetite <laughs> suppression. So I'm not your guy. Uh, lowering cholesterol levels, uh, social anxiety disorder. Okay, if you got that, I'm really sorry. But again, I don't meet indigenous folk that are worried about that one. <laughs> yeah, you get the idea. These are what the pharmaceutical targets are. Indigenous people, they're dying of diarrhea. That's the biggest single killer of indigenous people is diarrhea. Schistosomiasis. I mean, come on. You know, 100 million Africans having this stuff. Mm. Can't we fix it? You know, mm. guinea worm. They, they go blind, river blindness. They have to have a rope. I mean, you know. Filariasis, this is all through the Pacific. River Blanc, so you get the idea. Indigenous needs are different from Western needs and I'm mm -hmm. really happy to help discover good drugs for Western people, but I owe a deep debt to these indigenous people who've helped me and loved me, cared for me, nursed me. I don't know how to describe it, but I really care about these people. Mm -hmm. Western drugs are too costly for most of these folks. We need low cost alternatives. One thing my hat's off to these guys at my Dole University in Thailand, they found that a beach morning glory was as good as ibuprofen in treating inflammation. So you can go in for 25 baht now, almost any pharmaceutical, uh, any drugstore in Thailand, 25 cents and buy this crude tincture, which really works. <clears throat> my hat's off to this. This is awesome. I want to come up with drugs that work for poor people as well as rich people. Hmm. We need safety and efficacy studies. Here's one of my buddies and frankly, a hero of mine, Dr. Michael Heinrich at London School of Pharmacy. He went down to Oaxaca to study what they did for diarrhea, which I told you is the biggest, single biggest killer of, of uh, indigenous people. Found out that others were cooking rice and having their children drink the water off the rice. Found this amazing pharmacology of rice water, how it really stops water absorption in the colon. Does that work for serious things like cholera? Let's find out. One of my buddies, Dr. Stephen King at Jaguar Pharmaceuticals, go figure, they're in Burlingame, now has an FDA approved drug for treatment of diarrhea by HIV AIDS patients made from a tree bark in Peru. And then there's a lot of wisdom in these indigenous people. They have their, so I went over to Chengdu, sort of gateway to Tibet and China. Great scientist, great chemistry. You go in one level of hospital, there's the Western medicine, go up one level. Here's the traditional medicine. It's integrated. 
They don't see themselves as adversaries. They have this great herbal treatment for the treatment of pancreatitis. For the poorest of the poor who don't have any money at all, I say, let's get pharmaceutical manufacturing plants to them. And you probably guessed what those are. Those are plants. Mm. Plants produce the most amazing source of pharmaceuticals. I'd like to work with WHO to come up with a packet of 12 seeds. Mm. 12 seeds where we have complete chemistry, complete efficacy, uh, complete safety. For example, if you're down in the Caribbean or Central America and you get diarrhea, they're probably going to make you guava leaf tea. Mm. And it really works. You know, I'd like to get the pharmaceutical firms to pay back. Let's do all the studies and then get these seeds going out to the people who don't have any money at all. And maybe one of you listening to this lecture can help. Maybe you can help us touch the people that don't have any money at all for medicine. Uh, this is called a shameless uh, product placement. Uh, I just published with my buddy at uh, uh, Michael Ballack at New York Botanical Garden. A book, and I assure you, David Randall, this is selling dozens of copies throughout the world. <laughs> yep, I, I had the earlier version. I well, had, here's yes. the new and updated. I'll send okay. you a copy, Desmond. Okay. I had a sandwich, I give you half. You know that. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> and uh, with that, uh, I think there's a bright future in plant-based uh, bio uh, drug discovery. So let me see if I can uh, now stop the share and get back to our beautiful greenhouse here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you. Very good. This was a great seminar to start us off. Here is the book in my library. Hey. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, you, you know, know, Desmond, the, uh, the Scientific American publishers told me they sold a copy somewhere and I've always been wondering who got it. So it's pretty <laughs> funny. I've oh, got it. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> so there's so much to talk about and questions. I want to lead off with something that you did in terms of your presentation, your presentation style. Very, very early on, you said, where some people see a forest, I see a pharmacy. That's right. And, yeah. And we talked about this with my senior students in preparing them to give seminars that you want to lead off whatever you're saying, whatever presentation with like the, the thesis statement, the, the motivation, the why of what you're doing. And I think that really captivates, uh, uh, captures what you were, what you followed with throughout your seminar. Well, thank you. So does that mean, uh, Professor Murray, I can get an A minus instead of a B plus now. Sure, I, <laughs> sure you can. Sure you can. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. All right. Okay, we open for questions. And I can see the chat screen as well. So maybe okay. you can field the questions. And if not, I can see them on chat as well. Nice, very nice. So yeah, you guys could either unmute yourselves um, to ask a question or put a question in the chat. I see somebody I, I raising a, their hand here. Josh, okay. John, Rosenberg. Yeah, I had a question. So I was wondering, like, we hear about, like, um, like finding these plants in exotic places, like on the side of cliffs and, you know, in these tropical climates and stuff. But I was wondering how, like, uh, someone like me, you know what I mean, just with basic chemistry skills, right, could learn to see, like, the forest outside of Andrews as a mm -hmm. pharmacy. Well, I'm really glad you said that because... Uh, I, this was a hole in my lecture. We find lots of useful compounds from temperate plants as well. Mm -hmm. For example, cyclosporin, which is given to every heart and kidney transplant patient in the world so they don't reject their organ, was discovered by Michael Dreyfus at Sando Pharmaceuticals from a soil sample, fungus growing in a golf course in Oslo, Norway. <laughs> 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 so, uh, but the, I think we increase our chances in the tropics, because there's so many more plants. In a single hectare of the Amazon, there's more species than all of New Jersey and New York put together. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the key for me is having indigenous people who's learned over centuries which plants are good and which to use. So, so I'm sort of hedging my bets there, but John, that was an excellent question. Thank you. And you can discover cool things 
right out. So you could probably go to the grocery store and cover some school things. So thanks for that great question. So as a follow-up to that question, how do you become, for young people like John, how do you become an ethnobotanist? What do you have to quote unquote take? And is there like a market for ethnobotanists? Well, I'm so glad you asked that. Well, when I went to my uh, PhD studies, um, I was trained as an evolutionary biologist, mm -hmm. but there was an ethnobotanist at Harvard named Richard Evan Schulte. He's a really famous guy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when he heard that I could speak a couple of Polynesian languages, because I'd basically been exiled by my church to remote islands for a couple of years. <laughs> and the people were so sweet and <laughs> taught me how to speak, you know. So you need to do ethnobotany. So I started doing it in my spare time. But then my mom, uh, after I got my PhD, came down with cancer. And I thought, boy, I could go back to uh, medical school and become an oncologist. I thought, well, maybe I have something unique, something unique. You know, I know about plants. I speak these weird languages. I, I get along really. I love the indigenous people. And uh, I decided to do that. So I went to the National Cancer Institute to talk to them about working with them. And I said, I think I have a 1% chance of discovering something. And they said, Paul, we've been talking about you. We think you have a 3% chance. I said, 3%, wow, I'm in, you know, there's only, it requires 33 other men or women like me and one of us is gonna hit. So, uh, but the one thing, and you're gonna think I'm saying this just because of Professor Murray, but do your chemistry. I mean, I got good grades in chemistry, but I didn't realize it was important. Mm. And now, I really wished I could go back again. Maybe you'd take me back, please, as a remedial student. You know, because I wish I would listen to every single thing. I mean, We'd be uh, happy to. There we go. Well, I want to come back. Andrews. But I really believe that chemistry is the language of life, mm -hmm. not mathematics. Mm -hmm. so thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, you illustrated that with the communication, right? The chemical communication between the sheep and the uh, and the cactus. <laughs> I see a really interesting comment in the chat here from Lisa. Okay. Uh, Alberg. Yes, yeah, she's one of our professors. And his courses are part of our discussions in Chem 405. So he's teaching Chem 405. Yes, yeah, she is, Dr. Alberg. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you, Professor Alberg. Good. <laughs> well, please remember that they originally came from plants. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Anybody has other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. So um, I had a, um, with the, um, so you're talking about in Desert Storm, how many of these soldiers were developing ALS. So what is the army doing now to try and prevent um, the um, soldiers, like ground soldiers or anybody else that are coming in close contact with the dust from um, inhaling these um, cyanamides in the dust? Well, that's a really great question, Zoe. Um, and the reason, uh, <clears throat> I'm so interested in your question. It's very timely. I've been talking to the Veterans Affairs today, at today, like before this, mm. about having them do a phase three trial for l for veterans. Um, because, you know, if it's something as simple as tweaking the diet to prevent some, uh, you know, some trouble, why not go for it, you know? Mm -hmm. so I'd be really excited. So, uh, um, but the one thing that's interesting, I, I put in a grant proposal to the Department of Defense and against the wishes of my scientists that work with me, I had the final paragraph and I said, you know, given these troubling findings, we believe that all US military activity in the Middle East should cease until we declare it safe. For some reason that didn't get accepted by the military. <laughs> so then, <laughs> so then I flipped that, that, that proposal right over to the governor Cutter and I wrote a different paragraph and said, we believe that traditional dress of the Bedouin and Islamic people could function as a HEPA filter to prevent inhalation. Boom, we got the money. And we actually did that study. <laughs> and we found out, sure enough, you wear one of these deals over your head and they're a big scarf, but they're protecting themselves from inhalation risks. So uh, right. maybe it's something we can learn too, you know? So anyway. Great you, question, Zoe. Thank you you. got to know your you got to know your yeah. audience. It says two participants have raised their hand. Can you see who that is, uh, Professor Murray? Um, Susan Chan. Yes. Good evening. I'm Susan Chan. Yes, Susan. Hello, okay. Dr. Murray. Hello. Thank you for the invite. 
No problem. Um, Fox, I'm joining from the University of the Southern Caribbean in Trinidad and Tobago. In the wow. <laughs> wow. Well, hello to everybody. And there are a couple of us students who have joined here from the university. Whoa. From the Department of Biological Sciences and Chemistry. So we are reconnecting with Dr. Murray this time and we want a conversation to go on. So I was so impressed that uh, my background is a medical anthropologist. Uh -huh. and, uh, I'm so much interested in your ethnobotany. <laughs> uh, so recently we were doing a, a study. I was uh, interviewing remotely um, the village chief of the Amerindian villages in Guyana. Hmm. Guyana, yeah. Mm. And uh, we were looking at the response to COVID situation. And through the interview, it was coming out that um, a lot of village um, medicine men are now involved in researching the plants uh, to find an alternative to vaccine. Because the, cool. the Amerindians are very resistant to vaccine. So they don't believe in being vaccinated. So they are finding solutions through the plant research uh, to find an alternative to vaccine. And so my question is to you is how do we empower the indigenous knowledge of the vast knowledge they have on the medicinal um, plants? And um, of course they do their own research, but they don't have a lab to you know, carry out. So they will do it in their own population to mm -hmm. find out what works or what does not work. So in your experiences and all, how would you empower the indigenous people to harness that indigenous knowledge and bring it into your, um, you know, um, into the pharmaceutical companies or how do you how do you go about it? I'm not an I'm not a um, student of uh, chemistry or biology, but with my anthropology and with my ethnobotany, I have uh, fairly good uh, been done studies with the medicinal plants that are being used by the um, the tribals and the Amerindian population in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful question. And uh, I can't tell you how delighted I am that you're calling from Trinidad. Mm. You know, Trinidad houses the world's greatest banana collection in the Botanic Gardens, mm -hmm. Simmons Banana Collection, which is precious beyond belief, particularly as different fungi are taking out bananas. Mm -hmm. And then you have this tremendous, wonderful diversity down there, you know, and, and I'm pleased to hear that you're uh, working in Guyana wonderful people there so i'm just going to leave this really smiling that uh, <laughs> i got a big welcome from trinidad and i hope i can come down there um sure. three quick questions um first of all you're seeing something that i haven't which is innovation and discovery by indigenous people the healers i deal with only do what their mothers and their grandmothers and their great grandmothers told them so mm -hmm. just like you're your GP doesn't innovate, <laughs> at least you hope they don't when you're sick. I don't see the discovery process. I just see the residual knowledge. So <clears throat> what you're doing is incredibly important. Secondly, how do we help indigenous people? Well, <clears throat> the Rio treaties are based on the idea of having technology rich countries work with uh, biodiverse rich countries to form partnerships. And I'm, I'm looking at <clears throat> Professor Murray right now and thinking, hey, maybe Andrews could get something going here mm -hmm. with Trinidad. You know, I mean, what a, what a terrific opportunity. Mm -hmm. On a personal level, I think by showing respect is one of the greatest things we can do. Mm -hmm. um, I teach my graduate students and postdocs. I say, look, when you walk into an indigenous village, if you think these people are benighted or savage or whatever your weird view is, They'll figure that out without you even opening your mouth. You have seen. Mm. So, but if you go in there and you're humble and you want to learn, and just because it's different, you don't reject it, you do it, you know, they'll figure that out too. I said, the second we start dealing with indigenous people, just by our presence, we're violating their culture. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. we have to do is teach them we want to learn. We will do what you tell us. So it's like having a little puppy. You have a little puppy that soils the car, but you don't kill it get a piece of newspaper and put it on it. I said, so be a little puppy. I said, knowledge, it's like siphoning gas out of a car. You know, you got to start that tube blower in the gas tank. If you want to learn, <clears throat> you got to be humble and respectful. Yeah. And, and then we uh, share our notes, our patents, our commercialization, uh, authorship, 
all the things that we can do to show how deeply we respect mm -hmm. and admire these people. And uh, so I, I really hope I can work. Why not? Maybe at this seminar, we can uh, count yeah. me in. Okay. Well, where you get going, just about to get <laughs> count me in. Now, yeah, now that we are on the virtual platform, you can be virtually anywhere in the world. So yeah. <laughs> We will. Oh, I, I want to be there in uh, in Trinidad. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, look, being in a greenhouse is great, but compared to being in Trinidad, it's like kissing through a screen door. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, I have okay. another well, question yeah. here. Renee, Thank Renee you. has a question. Renee Skeet, um, what are chemists, ethnobotanists, and other scientists doing to preserve? the important rainforest and have the indigenous people preserve their way of life. It's sort of piggybacking in a way on your last um, question there yeah, and uh, answer. And what was Renee's last name? Was that Renee question? Skeet. Nice, Renee Skeet. nice He's question. Exactly from Barbados, I'm going to reveal. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting my air ticket now. Um, I'd like you to write down a website. It's called Seacology. SEA. C O L O G Y, S E A C O L O S E A C O L O G Y, psychology.org. It's a foundation that my wife and I founded. We invented some cosmetics based on rainforest plants, gave the intellectual property foundation. It took off, wow. And uh, in fact, Christy Brinkley, the model, hmm. hosted a dinner for me in New York. We're walking down Fifth Avenue, paparazzi jump out. Wow. She was very gracious to these guys. And after I left, I said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Brinkley, but these people follow ethnobotanists wherever we go. So, <laughs> but anyway, so far we've built 365 schools, uh, power um, hospitals, medical schemes for indigenous people in islands around the world. I don't think we have a project yet in Trinidad or in Barbados. I would love to get a project there to help indigenous people. And it's a win-win. We build them a community project, a school, a hospital, whatever. In return, they protect their coral reef or their forest. Uh, Barbara and I just two years ago dedicated the 300th <coughs> school in a distant place. So please look, look up psychology.org. Um, I see a question here from Noel Huang. Mm -hmm. Thank you, she says. What would you say to those arguing the study and publication of knowledge regarding ethnobotany as a form of cultural after, uh, appropriation? How do you navigate the complicated social dynamics that come with receiving information from indigenous peoples? My view is complete disclosure. Hmm. In other words, I say to the people, hey, I'm an investigator, I'm a scientist. I think that your medicine works. And if it works for you, it'll work for anybody. I want to help sick people elsewhere. Would you join me in that? I will only record what you allow me to record. I have improved my work. So I, I show respect to them. Um, what can I say here? I was flying on the airplane to Switzerland and give a talk. We're talking about conservation, the guy says, oh, well, you're a big conservationist, he says. But here you're flying on this plane causing this uh, carbon output. How do you? justify that. I said, well, you know, my foundation is set aside 1.5 million acres of rainforest and coral reef. So I, I'm sort of discounted this flight, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my view on indigenous people is I want to make sure that what I do shows respect mm -hmm. and helps protect the culture and continue it. And I think if you ask the indigenous people I work with, they, they see me as somebody that helps, not somebody that exploits. But that's a Good question, Noel, and I'm really glad you answered it. Mm -hmm. Gloria O says, Psychology funded 20 years ago. Are you doing anything for the organization's 20th anniversary? Um, well, we can talk about that. It was, uh, let's see, is it 20 years ago? Actually, 30 years ago in 92. Okay. Uh, we're just out doing projects. Look it up. Zach Alane says, Are there any attempts to integrate traditional medicine into modern healthcare? <clears throat> you know, the Physicians are getting a lot more open to this. Mm. And I'm pretty excited about it now. They're mm. a lot more open. I mean, a lot of physicians are using aloe vera, which mm -hmm. comes from Ethiopia to treat burns, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and NIH has a now an Institute of Alternative Complementary Medicine. So I just think those of us involved in this 
need to communicate better. Um, what, what questions do you see there, uh, Professor Murray? Um, I don't. Somebody else had their hand raised, and I can't see Somebody that. raise. If... Oh, it's Sean Rosenberg has a follow up, maybe. Go okay. ahead, John. Go ahead, John. Oh, yeah. I had another question. So one of my friends went uh, and did a missionary uh, to Madro, like a Marshall Island off of Guam recently. Yeah. And I was looking up some information about the islands around there. And I read some that they're being like uh, majorly threatened by um, uh, raising sea levels. Mm -hmm. And I saw on your website that you just posted that you work like uh, very like closely, you work mostly or a lot on islands. So I was like wondering how you deal with that, knowing that like these islands may be like they're put on a lot of like putting put on pressure and they may possibly be uh, in trouble in the future. And, you know, like that source of information may not be around forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> how can I say this? I'm not a climate scientist, but I totally accept what they're saying because the glaciers don't lie. Mm -hmm. The glaciers are, 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 you know, going away here in Grand Tetons where I live. The glacier used to come almost down to Lake Moran, uh, off Mount Moran. The Skittle Glacier is now almost gone. And it's no joke for people to live on, slow, on small coral atolls. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot more extreme weather. So uh, anything we can do, and the great solution botanically, frankly, is to plant a tree. Think of that. If you look at the mass of a tree, <clears throat> all of that mass comes from carbon. You know, I mean, if you dry it, it's all, basically all carbon. There's, Yep. Very little that comes from other nutrients. Mm -hmm. So protect forests, plant forests, help indigenous people. Um, one thing we did do is we made a deal with Sri Lanka to provide uh, uh, benefits for 15,000 coastal women. We provided microloans and job training, return for them protecting all of their uh, mangroves. And they won the Commonwealth and the UN. Uh, we, they won the Commonwealth uh, Prize for most carbon sequestered through mangroves. We won the UN Climate Change Prize and we were nominated for the uh, uh, Nobel Prize in Oslo. I mean, the point is, this isn't about prizes, it's about devastation these people will really face. And my hat's off to Greta Thunberg and I hope she wins the prize instead of us because uh, she shows what one person can do to raise this attention. So thanks, what a great question. Um, All right, well, I think we probably need to wrap up but I'm pretty sure um, you'd be willing to answer questions by email or, you know, if you yeah, uh, sure. want to follow up. So we want to thank you very much. This was a great seminar to lead off our series. And one of the things that truly impressed me, and I'm pretty sure others got the impression, is your humanity that you bring to your science and to your work. And we applaud you for that. And I know sometimes people throw around the phrase role model and some people don't like it, but um, it fits you in terms of bringing science and humanities together. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you, Professor Murray. And <clears throat> what a wonderful occasion. You know, uh, I have to tell you though, uh, what I was taught I learned in the islands. I mean, I got very sick. This guy was walking eight miles every day, tried to teach me his language. One day I was just too sick. He brought this coconut basket where he dumped it on the mat next to me. Mm. He'd gone and spent all the money he had at the local little trader shop mm. buy imported goods. He said, maybe you're not used to our food. Maybe you're sick because he says, this stuff comes from where you come from. Eat this instead. I was so touched. And I've spent the last uh, 30 years trying to pay back the content of that coconut basket. So the humanity here is not me as a researcher. It's the indigenous people. Okay. And they're, they're, they're under the gun. They need to protect their cultures. They need to protect their languages. They need to protect their habitats. And I think anything we can do to get behind them uh, really helps. One thing I'll say is I wrote a memoir of my work, if any of you are interested, mm -hmm. called Nafanua, N-A-F-A-N-U-A. Nafanua gives you an idea what it's like to do this sort of work. And again, you'll see the deep uh, respect I have for what I think are the real heroes for the indigenous people. So oh. thanks so much for having me today. And let's stay in touch. And I we, want to go to Trinidad. I want to go to Barbados. Let's go. Okay. Let's All get right. a Department of Chemistry field trip, okay? Okay, let's give Professor, well, Dr. Cox, a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Okay, we'll be in touch.
Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Okay, bye bye. Thank Thanks, Professor Randall. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chan. Greetings to everybody down there. Thank you. Thank you.